So you, uh, you know, you're from New York, grew up in Dallas, played in some bands. Um, I was curious what, what your uh, rock band was called and when did you move to Austin and what was the whole thing with you being a pre-med to uh, the RTF? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so uh, I was born in New York, in Poughkeepsie, New York. Uh, my family, uh, let's start that over again. Um, I was born in Poughkeepsie, New York, where my dad was doing his residency as a Freudian psychoanalyst. And uh, when I was five years old, we moved to Dallas. And I grew up in Dallas, um, went to high school at Hillcrest High School, uh, had some friends that played music. And uh, I started out playing kind of folk music in various uh, coffee houses around Dallas. And uh, somewhere in high school, I got interested in doing rock and roll, joined my friend's band. Uh, we had a band, uh, kind of a folk rock band for a while. Then I joined another band uh, called the St. Louis Union Blues Band. Well, at first that band was called Sammy Loria and the Nighttime and we played kind of um, uh, soul music. Mm, original? Uh, no, no, uh, like oh. kind of soul music covers. Uh, but, uh, Pretty soon, some of the members of the band started getting interested in psychedelia, and we wanted to change our band and start playing psychedelic music. So we had to kick Sammy Loria out of his own band and start our own band uh, that was called the St. Louis Union Blues Band and the Psychedelic Light Show. And we uh, bought a light show, played various frat parties around uh, Texas, traveled uh, one summer, uh, summer that we graduated from high school to uh, Louisiana and played in a bar there for like three weeks um, and got arrested in Galveston for playing too loud on the beach. Uh, went to trial there, but uh, the charges were dismissed. Um, and uh, after high school, I uh, went to Austin to go to school at the University of Texas. And uh, because my father was a psychoanalyst, I was sort of expected to follow in his footsteps and become a doctor. So I was uh, first enrolled in, um, in pre-med. And in some of the pre-med classes, I met a guy named Daniel Pearl, who was another kind of long-haired freak like I was. And um, we started hanging out and being buddies. And uh, I was playing at some various coffee houses around Austin by myself. Um, and then uh, some friends of mine from the Dallas band came to school at UT. And uh, we started a band, decided it would be really funny to uh, throw a sock hop at the state hospital. Uh, and so we started a, a university organization so we could have access to playing at the, uh, on campus uh, and hosted a big thing called the sock hop at the state hospital. And uh, that band was called Ramon and Ramon and the Four Daddios. And we went on to kind of have a illustrious, infamous career for a few years playing Austin frat parties and, uh, and at the uh, Vulcan Gas Company. And we played opening weekend at the Armadillo World Headquarters. We were kind of like a notorious hippie party band playing kind of psychedelic versions of 50s golden oldies uh -huh. music. We Did had you know a, the other bands? Did you uh, were you familiar with the Austin bands in, in the scene then? Uh, yeah, yeah. We we you know hung out at the Vulcan Gas Company and saw um, you know all the bands that were playing there. And um, and because Jim Franklin kind of took a liking to our band, Jim Franklin, the the poster artist yeah. for for Vulcan Gas Company and later on Armadillo, uh, he took a liking to our band and kind of forced himself on us and joined the band and became like our MC uh, when we were on stage. Uh, but the great thing was he was our poster artist too. So yeah. we got some beautiful posters out of it. Um, and he, wow. he, was, uh, he was played with us until you know, the band broke up eventually. I didn't uh, know that with Jim Franklin. Uh, yeah, yeah, he was like a crowbar, the infamous crowbar. You can see him in some of the photographs. On Facebook, there's a Ramon and Ramon and the Four Daddios page with a bunch of photographs oh, nice. of us. Um, and uh, so while we were playing, uh, we also actually did a real sock hop at the state hospital, somehow got ourselves booked to play a party at the state hospital for kids. 
And uh, Daniel Pearl, who was my friend uh, from school, uh, had a camera. We went and shot that, and hopefully we're going to get that footage yeah. transferred one of these days. Um, so anyway, Daniel Pearl and I uh, eventually got kind of like realized that we were not cut out to be doctors. Um, and uh, another friend took me one night to see a movie on campus uh, called Juliet of the Spirits, the Federico Fellini film. And uh, we also dropped acid and kind of went to see that film. And it changed my whole life because I realized then that I could, that making movies, you could make music, you could create images. And um, so I, me and Daniel both just kind of changed our major, joined the radio, television, and film department. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned seeing the, the Seventh Seal. Was that the same theater? Uh, it was probably a different screening program uh, a, a, another week or two after I saw Federico Fellini's Juliet of the Spirits. Uh, the same friend, the same LSD, uh, went to see uh, Bergman's The Seventh Seal, and that really kind of nailed it for me that that movie making yeah. could be the art that, that would combine everything that I was uh, interested in doing. And they were showing a lot of those European art films put on by UT, right? Was it the Cinema 40 uh, Society that did that? There was the Cinema 40 Society. There was like screenings at the Commons, what, whatever the place was called where the, where the cafeteria was. There were screenings at various places around campus. There were screenings uh, just in the RTF department. Uh, so yeah, we were, uh, our, our, uh, the guy who headed the department was Rod Whitaker at the time who uh, wrote novels under the name Trevanian. Uh, and he was a, in, an immense inspiration to us all as a director. So you were with, uh, with Daniel in, in the RTF then. Were, were you guys uh, involved with uh, student films together? Or uh, how, how did that work? Yeah, we did student films uh, together. Uh, we did little tiny projects together where, you know, Daniel and I uh, would shoot, he would shoot something for me, or I would shoot something that he was directing. Um, and we, I mean, we basically were just, just hung out a lot. And he had a very engineering sort of mind and, and it was appropriate that he went into becoming a director of photography. Uh, and I was more kind of the director and uh, writer type, you know, so, so we had a very good kind of symbiosis between us. Were you making uh, a lot of uh, student films then? You have access to those? Uh, you mentioned one called Southern Hospitality before. Uh, does that uh, still exist? Uh, I'm curious about seeing that. Yeah, our student films, actually Daniel and I just got together uh, last week mm -hmm. uh, because he's got uh, a company that, that offered to like convert some of his movies from 16 millimeter to digital. And um, so he invited me to bring over Southern Hospitality. Uh, so yeah, I've got Southern Hospitality. I did a little animated film to uh, Frank Zappa's Call Any Vegetable oh, yeah. uh, with animated stop motion animated vegetables. Um, I did, uh, there's, a, I have a lot of films on eight millimeter, uh, which I have not converted yet. I did a film called uh, Man with a Million Dollar Smile about uh, a guy who's a star of toothpaste ads because his teeth are so white. Uh, and uh, yeah, so so at the time, um, uh, public television was providing money to the UT film department uh, to to kind of fund some of our shorts. So so we were really lucky that we had not only the inspiration of um, Rod Whitaker, but money that was coming to us to to help us make films, and plus the the amazing uh, equipment that they had in the department. Was that the KLRN, the uh, public access or the uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson station? That was Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, back in those days, KLRN. Yeah, yeah. So you guys, uh, did, did you meet Larry in the RTF uh, soon after? Yeah, Larry Carroll was a teaching assistant uh, in the film department. Uh, at that time, the film department wasn't in that big rust building that it's in now, but was in a little mansion down by the, down on the, like uh, like the eastern, northeastern edge of campus uh, in a little mansion of its own. And 
we had access to it 24 hours a day. Uh, Larry Carroll was a teaching assistant. Uh, Richard Kouris, who went on to become a kind of real estate mogul and film producer in, in Austin, was teaching camera. Uh, and a guy named Ron Policy, uh, who uh, kind of uh, came from Hollywood to teach us. And he kind of taught us what it was like to deal with asshole producers. So we basically had the the kind of spiritual mentor in, in uh, Rod Whitaker, the technical mentor in, in Richard Kouris, and the reality mentor in Ron Policy. So in a way, it was like the perfect kind of uh, film education. You mentioned a, a Courtney Gooden as well, and a Jim, Jim Bogart. Did you guys work with them then? Yeah, basically, uh, Courtney Gooden was another buddy from uh, film school. He was uh, he, he was a DJ at uh, LBJ's radio station and and was basically a, a sound engineer. Uh, but he also had a crazy technical mind and he was in film school with us. So uh, Courtney, uh, when Daniel was not available because he was doing something else, Courtney uh, shot my movie Southern Hospitality, which was mm -hmm. uh, the, the film that we were talking about that, that got an, a, a Student Academy Award nomination. Uh, Courtney shot that film, taught me a lot about recording sound so that uh, when it came time for Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Courtney was busy working on a movie called- uh, In San Antonio, uh, right? Yeah, a movie yeah. in San Antonio, Prelude to Happiness, it was called, oh, about okay. a, a woman with one leg and you know finding love again or something but when courtney was busy doing that uh i had been courtney's uh boom operator on a mm. lot of little movies and, and commercials and stuff so uh the offer was made to me to be sound recordist on chainsaw massacre so there was a courtney gooden in the film school um a guy named jim bogard who uh w was a little bit younger than us but was a great kind of guy to have on your crew because he was kind of a big Viking of a character and and super uh, willing to do anything to help you get your movie made. So between Courtney, Jim Bogard, there was a guy named Tom Harrod who uh, still lives in Texas, who uh, was kind of a producer type at the time. Um, and he directed a movie uh, that I shot. So basically we were all just kind of doing whatever was necessary to help each other get our movies made. Were you working together uh, as a, a, a collective? Were, were you called Shootout then, or did that come later? Shootout came later. Daniel and I were trying to figure out exactly when it when Shootout occurred. Mm -hmm. And we think it was right after we graduated from, uh, maybe from grad school, um, like 72 or something like that. Uh, I didn't graduate grad school until years later because I uh, had a daughter and, and just kind of was like, what, what do I need this for? And, and put it off and put it off until they kind of begged me to finish up and, and get my master's degree. So um, Courtney, uh, we were all, we weren't really a collective, but we were kind of simpatico friends that, that worked together and, mm -hmm. and um, just, you know, loved making movies. I mean, you must have uh, at least worked on that that drug bust film that Toby apparently saw and wanted to hire you guys because of that. Uh, yeah, that was, I, I believe, uh, by the time we had shootout and we had a contract with um, with a guy named Jack Canson, who mm -hmm. owned a, a advertising agency who also did a lot of contract work for the state. Um, and I don't know how what they were thinking because here we were the most biggest pot smoking bunch of uh, hippies yeah. that you could imagine um, getting it hired to uh, enter the kind of evil fortress of the Department of Public Safety and shoot in their in their paraphernalia uh, vault and meet all of their scientists and then recreate a drug bust in uh, Daniel's actual apartment. Uh, it was I mean, you know, uh, I guess it, there were, things were wild back in Texas in those days. Yeah. Where would Toby have seen that? I, I'm very curious to see, see that film as well. Uh, you know what? I don't see how Toby saw that film. Uh, you know, that's that, Daniel and I were talking about this. It's like um, 
where did you hear that basically you know it, it's in a lot of print uh, media and i think toby has claimed to have seen it as well in, in uh, okay in maybe daniel had a copy of it maybe we were editing it at the time and maybe larry showed it to him uh uh, to get the job as editor, or maybe Daniel showed it to him. I do not know. Uh, I, and I, I, I try to remember if I ever saw the finished product, and I'm not sure, man. Did, did you direct it? Uh, no, I don't think I did, actually. That might have okay. been a Larry project. It, it, at Shootout, it was kind of like, and as one of the reasons we kind of like split apart eventually, there were too many people wanting to direct and not enough uh, work to kind of go around for all of us. Yeah. I directed the the traffic safety commercial that or public service oh, announcement yeah. with the ambulance and the, the blood pumping out of the victim's mouth uh, that that uh, maybe was deemed too harsh to to show. Have you seen those films recently? No, no, man, I yeah. have not. Uh, I, Daniel was, or was it you? We're going to try to look into the Department of Public Safety. Yeah, I, I, I wrote to it. them uh, recently, but I've uh, yet to hear back. See if it's oh. in their archives. Hopefully, it's <laughs> up. <laughs> I hope so, man. That would be truly incredible to see. Yeah. Well, also that uh, you know, so you want to be a rock and roll star? I think Daniel's trying to get that redone. That aired on PBS. Uh, yeah. In fact, that was uh it was funny because I I I think. Basically, he used a little bit of that footage from our uh, sock hop at the state hospital, the mm -hmm. Ramona Ramon gig. Uh, and then maybe we recreated some additional footage uh, and we were trying to determine if it was maybe against the white backdrop for the stage at Vulcan Gas Company, or maybe he used just footage from the sock hop, but, but I don't think so because it seemed like I was dancing around a lot more than than I would normally on stage. But um, yeah, that's one of the batch of films that Daniel's trying to get uh, converted right yeah. now. Yeah, and you redid the, the song for that, right? Because you couldn't get Roger McGuinn's, uh, they couldn't afford the rights. Right, yeah, Daniel tried to get uh, So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star from Roger McGuinn and, and it was like too expensive. So I wrote a song and recorded it, but uh, you know I'm not a great guitar player, um, so we asked uh, Jimmy Vaughn to come in and, mm -hmm. and uh, lay down a guitar lead track for us. And he's and he related nice to enough. Stevie Ray. He is Stevie Ray's older brother. Mm. Wow. <laughs> and Daniel yeah. told me about uh, so so. Uh, Jimmy Vaughn came to uh, Daniel's house to lay down the tracks. And we were in there, you know, smoking some pot. Yeah. And Stevie Ray was trying to get in the door, but we wouldn't let him in because he was like a minor at the time. So yeah, yeah, Texas was harsh on, uh, you know, pot smoking. Then I know. Oh man, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're very lucky we made it through that without ever getting arrested. Yeah. Um, we also did a short that I think Daniel shot um, with uh, Jim Franklin as the star. That oh, was wow. based on uh, Godot's Waiting uh, for Godot. Uh, I mean, uh, based on Waiting for Godot, uh, that was called Waiting for the Ultimate Casserole, that uh, we're also trying to get converted right now. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to see that again. And Jim Franklin was asking about that recently. Yeah, I'd love to see that. Are you still in, in touch with Jim Franklin? Uh, we're Facebook friends and we message back and forth every oh, once nice. in a while. And every time I go to Austin, he seems to be at the place where I am and it's and, and it's just like you pick up right where you left off you know like never yeah. like time has not passed I mean we spent a lot of time traveling around Texas uh, for Ramon and Ramon gigs and basically we had a an old school bus that we traveled in and uh, going down to Houston to do a gig one time we came up with the idea of the the pumpkin stomp because it was a gig that was going to be around Halloween. So we conceived this, uh, this uh, party on stage called the Pumpkin Stomp that uh, we did in Houston, where we had a, bought yeah. a bunch of pump pumpkins along the way and smashed and stomped them and threw them off the balcony of the club. It was 
quite what, a... What club was that? Did, did you ever play at that Love Street Light Circus Feel Good Machine uh, venue? Uh, I think that was the place. Was it? Oh, wow. Was that place upstairs? Yes, uh, yeah, that's yeah. it. That's where we did the pumpkin stomp. Yeah, we played oh, nice. there and we played a place called Liberty Hall in Houston. Now, you mentioned seeing Lightning Hopkins as well. Did, was that in Houston, the guitar no. player from Houston? Uh, no, Lightning Hopkins I saw, uh, I was playing back in my folk music days, playing at a, at a little place called the Glad Hand, which was like a very tiny coffee house. Um, and Lightning Hopkins played there and I kind of opened for him. Wow. Oh, that's very cool. I, I love the, the Texas scene back then, and especially Houston, where Love Street is. The, the building's still there. It's just not, you know, psychedelic rock club anymore. But is it is it a disco or some kind of a club or bar? Um, no, they, they renovated it um, a few years ago uh, to make it was originally a coffee house. I did a little documentary on it a while back, but uh, wow, they're they're not um, you know it's not open yet, but it's nice that it's still there. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, no, that, that was a fun time, man. I don't I don't know how we made it without going to prison, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so now. Uh, as far as getting involved in Chainsaw, how did that come about? Daniel got hired on first, right? And got you guys on? Yeah, Daniel was hired by Toby to shoot Chainsaw. Uh, and at the time, Courtney Gooden was the kind of premier sound man in Austin. And I, would, I had been his boom operator on a couple of gigs. Um, and right when Toby was gonna shoot Chainsaw Massacre, uh, a guy named Gidney Talley in San Antonio was uh, directing his movie um, called Prelude to Happiness. And Courtney uh, got hired on to do sound for Prelude to Happiness, leaving Toby without his first choice, but with me as kind of like the, the, the protege of, of Courtney. So uh, I got hired to do the sound on Chainsaw. And also you uh, sort of donated your van. Was that supposed to happen from the get-go? I heard you got an extra $100 a week for that, but did you volunteer <laughs> it or how did that work out? I think they, they just said, we need a van. Uh, and Daniel's van was kind of the camera van. So mm -hmm. I had a van kind of similar to it. And um, so I said, well, here, you can have mine. And they took me up on it first day of shooting, took the back seat out of the van and let, left it by the side of the road to make room for Franklin in his wheelchair, drove up and down the road for all the driving shots. And when we came back to find my, to get my uh, seat, somebody had stolen it already or lifted it off the side of the road. So yeah. my van was forever marked by having a mismatched rear seat. Well, it got damaged prior. Uh, you, you said you lent it to another film, right? And, and it hit a cow in the... On, in the uh, yeah, uh, that same van uh, a year or so later was, uh, I, I rented it out to a student film production at UT and they took it, God knows where, out in the country and driving back, uh, hit a cow and hmm. splattered cow guts and cow shit all over the undercarriage of the van, which took a long time to clean out. So that was after Chainsaw then? After Chainsaw, I think it was part of the Chainsaw dead animal curse that yeah. kind of stuck to a lot of things for that movie. So now as far as the first day of shooting, what, what did you shoot? Were, were they the band scenes? Or I know uh, I've heard the con concrete house was shot there as well. Yeah, I can't exactly remember the first day of shooting, although I think it was the 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 driving scenes and if it wasn't it was the kind of abandoned house that uh, existed across the highway from from the chainsaw massacre house yeah. and that house was just kind of tumbled down and every room you went into the walls were covered with uh, daddy long legs spiders that were kind of pulsing like daddy long legs do yeah was now freaky. was larry there on set with you during those scenes I don't remember Larry too much on the set. I mean, yeah, basically right. my job as sound man was to kind of help the boom operator organize himself for, you know, where to position himself uh, to capture the dialogue. And then for me to get out of the way and not be obtrusive to the, to the work that was going on on the set. So a lot of my experience of Chainsaw is 
kind of short bits of rehearsal and then, you know, sitting in a room by myself. Yeah. Well, now what you were in the van um, during those uh, op opening scenes, what were you using to record? Like what was, what were the, uh, what was the gear like? So basically uh, for Chainsaw Massacre, we were recording on a Nagra quarter inch tape machine, which was kind of the state of the art at the time. Oops, hold on. Uh, so uh, basically for Chainsaw Massacre, we were recording sound on a Nagra quarter inch tape machine, which was kind of the industry standard at the time for recording sound for uh, movies. And um, using a Sennheiser shotgun mic for most of the dialogue scenes that was kind of held on a boom pole over the actors. And the, the trick of that is being able to pan the, the directional mic to catch whoever happens to be speaking. Uh, for the van scenes, uh, that was not a practical solution. So we put a lavalier mic on every speaking character and uh, wired them to a little mixing panel that I had. And I was hidden behind some luggage in the very back of the van, kind of mm. crouched down on the floor, uh, kind of mixing up a mic when somebody would speak and mixing it down and back up as as people spoke. And yeah. uh it turned out pretty good because I don't think they had to, normally you would just replace all that dialogue these days, but they didn't have to do that for that film. For those van scenes, was Wayne there with you in, in the van? Uh, not in the van, no, in the okay. van, it was like so, so crowded. And because Wayne at the time was, was my boom operator, uh, maybe he helped me get the lavaliers on all the actors and get everything organized but it was just me in the van and Daniel in the van and probably Toby somewhere stuck in yeah. there too. So I guess after those uh, van scenes in the abandoned house uh, the next thing you shot seems to be uh, Terry's meat hook scene and uh, the um, sawing of uh, Bill Vale's character when your daughter supposedly you know came on set and saw Leatherface. What, what do you remember about that? Uh, yeah so uh, on Chainsaw my wife at the time, Sally Nicolau, was yeah. the caterer. And uh, she would bring food every day at lunchtime. And we had a daughter who was two years old at the time, uh, Karina. And Karina would uh, come with her because that's the way it was back in those days. And uh, Karina sort of had full run of the set and would run around and talk to people and hang out with Gunner, Tom, uh, Gunner Hansen, who was, uh, who was playing uh, Leatherface when he was not in his Leatherface mask. And on the particular day when we were shooting the scene where Pam gets hung on the meat hook and her boyfriend is laid out on the butcher block and Leatherface is about to cut into him with the chainsaw, we uh, started shooting that scene. And I was thinking to myself, this is probably the most horrifying tableau that I've ever seen in my entire life. And just as I was thinking that, and the chainsaw was revving up and, the, and Pam was screaming her guts out, I heard this other scream right next to me through my headphones. And I looked over and Corina had come in to say hello to everybody and had just stopped in her tracks and was white and screaming at what she was seeing in front of her and went tearing out of the house. And so as soon as we cut, you know, I pulled off my headphones, went running after her. Gunner came out and said, look, no, it's only me. It's only me. Yeah. Uh, but she was traumatized, traumatized for the rest of the day. And she later wrote a little article about it for yeah. the Texas Monthly. And I was trying to find that. Uh, I know she, she wrote that her and Gunner bonded on set, but uh, she, she, I guess, hadn't seen him in the mask that day. No, not, not, and not chopping somebody up and somebody else yeah. screaming and hanging. Yeah, yeah. As far as a Sally, how did she get the job of the caterer? Did you recommend her? Or how did that happen? Mm, she was a really good cook. And uh, yeah, just we needed a caterer and she volunteered. She later owned a little restaurant on 6th Street in Austin. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, and so she was... She was the chosen one for that. 
Yeah. Now, where did the whole uh, pot brownies she made come into play? Do you remember what night that was on? <laughs> no, I do not remember that, probably because I had a couple of brownies. Yeah. Uh, but uh, at one time she, because uh, the Chainsaw Massacre house was kind of a little farmhouse yeah. and part of the farm had a small plot of marijuana plants growing. And uh, so I guess she got, she thought it would be funny once to, uh, to bring us some brownies, some pot brownies. So she made some pot brownies and people didn't realize what they were as they were mm -hmm. eating them. And it was a stoned day on set, which I do not even remember. Yeah, because the uh, tenant of the house, uh, a guy named Smokey, didn't he say you guys can, you know, help yourself to whatever you want. You just can't take it off the property. Were you yeah, guys, uh, partaking? Uh, not, I was not partaking during a shooting day, but I certainly took a little bit and, you know, smoked it on my way home. And uh, I can't speak for anybody else, but, uh, you know, it was definitely a great invitation. Yeah, I, yeah, but I'm just trying to figure out when that would have happened. I heard different things as far as the night chase scene, which was uh, August 14th, I think, with the, with the slate. But then some say it was during the 27 hour, um, you know, dinner sequence, uh, which was on August 18th. I, I kind of doubt that it was the, the dinner sequence because yeah. that was a shooting day of all its own problems. Um, but I cannot tell you what day it was, you know, I do not know. What do you remember about, about that though, the whole dinner sequence, a 27 hour long shoot? We had uh, one scene, the dinner scene of Chainsaw, which I think the story is, and I'm pretty sure it's true, that there was a, a limited number of appliance makeups for yeah. Grandpa. And uh, we had one left, and we had this dinner scene to shoot, which really was like two days or three days worth of shooting the way Toby had envisioned it. But we only had one appliance and it had to be shot on that one day. So we started out in the morning, we shot all day, all night, and into to like noon or something of the following day and like 27 hours total of windows blacked out, a hot house, hot box of a house that was uh, stinking to high heaven from the costumes that hadn't been washed from the dead animals that were placed on the table from the head cheese on the table. Uh, there were some dead dogs that I think were brought out to the set yeah. as, as a potential set decoration, which were just too disgusting to, uh, to put on the set and they smelled like formaldehyde. So they had to be taken out and burned in a pit somewhere on the farm. So there was like, dead smoke kind of uh, blowing in the wind. It, it was one hellacious night of shooting. Yeah, and I've seen a, a, me and Daniel were um, trying to figure out, Lynn Lockwood is, is on the slate there and I've seen photos of him shooting. Uh, did he just come in for that day or do you remember him being on set and other days? I think Lynn, Lynn Lockwood was, uh, he came in from Dallas, right? Wasn't he a Dallas guy? I, I wasn't sure, I was trying to figure that out. I think Lynn Lockwood was uh, the when when the producers kind of shut us down for a period of time and tried yeah. to reorganize and get Toby to come up with a shot list and uh, and they they blamed it on a broken lens or something. Yeah. But I think the the real problem was they felt like we were moving much too slowly, and in fact we were moving uh, pretty slowly. And I think Lynn Lockwood was brought in as a gaffer to kind of help Daniel kind of move things along a little bit faster. Somebody with a little more experience than kind of the, the student kind of crew that we had. Um, so I believe he was there from the second or third week on. Okay, he, he's credited and, as lighting. And, and Daniel asked, uh, you know, uh, himself, uh, because it looks like he's, he's there on set that day, but I hadn't seen him, you know, elsewhere. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I think he, lighting was right, but he was brought in as the gaffer to, to, kind of, uh, to kind of move things along. So we had somebody 
absolutely dedicated to moving lights around according to Daniel's uh, needs. So you shut down, uh, first of all, who shut you down, I guess, after the first week? Do you remember that being uh, Ron Bozeman? I think it was a Ron Bozeman move, you know, and recently we had like the Chainsaw Massacre kind of oh, yeah. uh, uh, event and Ron was there and he was, he seemed a little evasive when he had to answer, when he was asked that question um, and, and blamed it on faulty lenses. But it was for sure the the producer, uh, what's his name, the money man, and probably forcing Ron to to come in and be the bad, bad cop on that situation. Yeah, I was wondering if it was either him or uh, Jay Parsley, Bill Parsley, but I heard he wasn't really on set. Uh, Bill Parsley was on set quite a bit. Oh, he he? would not on set because he would stay in his air conditioned Cadillac for the most part and let mm -hmm. Marilyn come in and kind of hang out in his Cadillac to cool off. Um, but he was he was a uh, kind of less he was less visible when we were at the farmhouse. Uh, but he was around, and I think he because it was his money at stake. Uh, yeah. I believe it was him. Probably he got together with Ron Bozeman, and you know they they just decided to be producers and try to try to take what was this organic way that Toby worked, which was a little scattered and very uh, methodical in making any decision and uh, tried to get him to work according to some more structured manner. Yeah, I heard he liked to just block, you know, on set there. And I guess, you know, he didn't uh, plan ahead of time. So that's why they requested that shot list be created. You know what? The shot list is the bane of filmmakers and every yeah. fucking producer around wants a shot list. And you can make a shot list. And after the first setup in the morning, your shot list means nothing. You know, it's great exercise to kind of make the filmmaker be organized. Uh, but anytime you get asked for a shot list, you're like, you just go, oh, no, what, why, you know? Yeah. Uh, and Toby especially would, uh, he and Kim would kind of sit for a couple of hours every day at the beginning of the shooting day and kind of hash out what they were going to shoot that day. Um, and then they'd bring Daniel into the discussion and they would work it out. And that's, that was just the way they did it. And, and it's like, you can't force somebody to make a shot list when you've got Daniel, who was like super creative and, and trying to elevate whatever shots that Toby wanted to do into something more complicated and interesting. Uh, and then you've got Toby, who's like, you know, just impossible to get him to commit to anything until yeah. he's really chewed it over a million times. Yeah, Toby said he just made it to appease the producers, but I know they tried to shut down when you guys came back and they didn't want Daniel to shoot that uh, swing shot, which is one of the greatest shots and, you know, a, a dolly shots in cinematic history. Yeah, yeah, that that uh, the the dolly underneath the swing set yeah. was a particular situation that that kind of calls the falsity of trying to make a, a, a shot list because unless the director and the director of photography kind of got together the day before and went, oh, this could be a great shot, you wouldn't see that shot until you started blocking the actors. And uh, so in a way, you know, I found in the films that I do, that the best way to do it is to have a rehearsal first thing in the morning. You know, I do a shot list, but it's just to kind of make myself understand what are the minimum number of shots you could do on a given day. Uh, but to block out the scene with the actors and automatically you, you see where the camera angles are. And that, that was one of those moments that Daniel said, oh, look at this, Toby. And they they said you know they threw away the shot list and said we're going to shoot this come hell or high water and yeah it's a, it's a great thing they did because it is a really cool shot yeah they, they threatened to quit if they, they didn't do it <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> no with, with toby as a director you remember his uh directorial style and, and do you know if he was um a self-taught as a filmmaker i've heard conflicting things I, I imagine Toby was self-taught and, and probably, you know, had a lot of experience and had, you know, organized film shoots before. Um, his style 
was kind of like Toby, you know, just a kind of gruff and cigar filled with cigar smoke. And um, basically he, he really worked with the actors. And, you know, even if at the time we didn't understand kind of what, what he was doing, uh, he obviously kind of knew what, the, what his end result was supposed to be. Um, so I have to give it to him. I, I was like, came from a different school of filmmaking, you know, yeah. at the university where you really had to be organized and every moment on the set was precious and should not be wasted. And for Toby, the moments on the set were basically trying to figure out what to do in a given day and then executing it as best he could. Yeah, so, had you, oh, go ahead. Uh, so the the producers, producers don't understand that that process and want something a little more quantifiable and and want you to stick to a specific schedule. But uh, with somebody like Toby, that was not going to happen. Yeah. Had you known of him as a filmmaker prior? Had you seen like Eggshells or any of his MPP Filmhouse stuff? No, I did not really know about Toby from the beginning. I saw Eggshells after uh, I was hired uh, to do the to do Chainsaw Massacre, um, but no, I just met him and started working for him. Now, as far as Kim, uh, he was there on set. You know, I know it confer with Toby, but didn't he direct a few uh, scenes as well, like the gas station scene? You know, I don't know about that. I, I my impression was Toby was there. I mean, that Kim Henkel was there to uh, as a writer and supporting of Toby. Uh, I don't remember him directing particular scenes. Yeah, it may have been just that one because I think uh, Toby got pissed off because the actors were laughing. Um, they did uh, splashed uh, Jim Cito with uh, water. And uh, I, think, I think he's stormed off. And Kim, there's photos of him, kind of looks like he's uh, taking charge and directing. That's uh, uh, That could be. I, I remember uh, Parsley's uh, Cadillac there in the parking lot. And mm -hmm. so there might have been some additional producer pressure on him, too. I think Parsley was very protective over Marilyn. And, and yeah. uh, if he felt like Marilyn was getting abused or, you know, uh, overworked, they probably put a lot of pressure on Toby. So so it, if he blew up, it, it might have had something to do with that too. Now, Parsley, was he the guy also with the RV? I heard you had an RV on set on, on some days, air conditioned. Uh, the RV, I don't know if it belonged to Parsley or not. I do remember an RV being there as like kind of the production vehicle on the makeup van. Um, I never got to hang out in that air conditioning though. Yeah. Now, as far as the, the ending sequence, it seems like you guys shot that uh, from September 1st to uh, the 3rd on uh, Labor Day. But what can you remember about that? Uh, there, there was one thing where I think you shut down the uh, road and uh, there was an incident where there was a you know, roadblock and a woman you know, um, was stopped by Ron Bozeman and uh, she came back with her husband with a gun. Do you remember any of that? <laughs> no, no, I don't remember that happening. No, no. Like I say, I was like focused on one thing and that was making sure the sound was recorded and then staying out of sight as much as possible. You know? Yeah, there's no interactions with any, I guess, locals or you know, anyone watching on set. No, I don't remember ever like there being any kind of like local people hanging around. We were in such remote places, you know. Yeah. Well, I heard also on that day you got in trouble with uh, a, uh, a sheriff, uh, Jim Boutwell, the, the guy who was uh, flying his plane uh, during the Charles Whitman 1966 UT uh, tower shooting incident and, and tried to take him out. But I heard he came to set because of the road blockade and said, you know, what, what are you doing? This is my road. And there is a sort of uh, scuff between him and uh, Toby and I guess uh, Ron Bozeman and Kim. Wow, no, see, that's like, all that kind of stuff is like production that I was not paying attention to. Yeah, and as, well, how about Larry? Uh, do you remember him being there towards the end? Cause he said he's uh, driving the, the pickup truck and some shots. 
for that last uh, that, day. That's possible. That's possible. I don't remember Larry being on set very much at all, though. You know. Yeah, he was the editor. Yeah, yeah. Well, so when, once filming wrapped, I guess, were you involved with uh, editing at, at all? Did you go? I know there was some uh, additional uh, shots filmed at the shootout offices where it was edited, like Marilyn's close up of her eye. Were you there for any of that? No, no. After after shooting wrapped on Chainsaw, I was like totally gone from the project. Uh, I recorded on the last few days of shooting. Uh, uh, Wayne and I recorded, you know, some, you know, crunching lettuce and, you know, various sound effects with uh, hammers hitting watermelons and stuff like that, just so they'd have some gory sound effects to work with yeah. in the post-production. Um, and it's entirely possible that they shot some insert shots at, at uh, shootout headquarters. Um, but I don't know where I was. I, I was like off doing my own thing, I guess, by that time. Yeah, so you didn't uh, follow uh, the film much once it came out? Uh, no, I saw the film, you know, in theaters like everybody else. Uh, and, um, you know, was really happy that it was such a success when it came out and and was kind of amazed you know it kind of shows you what a year of editing will do for a movie you know that that yeah. uh they they went and shot i wasn't even involved in the reshoots uh, or the the shoot again when they when they went and shot in the cemetery for the prologue to the film oh yeah ron perryman uh was was there for that i think he was oh there. and towards the end also the final sequence uh, Ron Perryman. Yeah, he was uh, Daniel's uh, assistant, right? Uh, assistant cameraman, I think. Um, he, he was there to help out, I think, towards towards the end. Um, but I think um, it, it was it was uh, his brother, Lou Perryman, that it was. His oh, Lou Perryman. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Ron Perryman uh, was the kind of crazy Austin film inventor yeah. who, had, who had built the, the crane. Right. Uh, and they probably used that in the opening sequence. Yeah. Yeah. To, it was Toby's partner. Now, as far as uh, after uh, Chainsaw, where did you um, film that that drunk driving PSA? Was that shortly after? Yeah, uh, we got the we were doing some public service announcements for the Department of Public Safety, and uh, we, we did little educational films for the Texas Department of Education um, at Shootout. And Jack Hansen came to us and what they wanted to do that drunk don't drink while you drive. Yeah. Uh, PSA. And so we put that together, got an ambulance and uh, went out to some little neighborhood of Austin and shot it in the street. Daniel was a uh, director of photography and I directed it. Oh, okay. That one you directed. And yeah. was the one with the, you went overboard on the gore where I guess we were reprimanded for that. Yeah, it wasn't. I mean, you know, as far as gore goes, it wasn't the most gory commercial that you could imagine, but it did I mean, the idea was don't drink and drive. And so we wanted to make it kind of hard hitting. And so the the EMTs were kind of suctioning blood out of the guy's mouth and you saw blood going through the tube and going into a little bottle. Uh, and then I remember the doors of the ambulance closing and driving off and we kind of tilted down and there was a martini glass on the, oh, yeah. on the road. Uh, but yeah, I don't remember it being all that gory, but but then again, I'm kind of like not, I'm immune to too much gore, I guess. But that was with, under shootout. Did you guys film much after that? Or what happened to where you, you know, dissolved and you guys moved to California? Uh, basically, shootout uh, was five of us. It was uh, Richard Kouris, uh, uh Daniel Pearl, me, Courtney Gooden, and Larry Carroll. And wasn't like the perfect blending of skills and there weren't a lot of uh, jobs to be had, you know? So it was like whoever answered the phone that day would kind of grab the job. And, uh, but then the same client might call and Larry wasn't there. I answered the phone and then Larry would get pissed off that I wasn't, that, uh, that he wasn't directing a piece. So it, it, it turned out that it wasn't the smartest company around. Um, and so eventually Richard Kouris and Jack Canson, our client, 
kind of bought us out and started their own company. Uh, Texas Pacific Film Texas Company? Texas Pacific Film Company, yeah. Um, and then Jack Canson was a, was a really great kind of impresario of Austin music and uh, film. Oh, yeah. And uh, had a band called Texoid. Oh, that, wow. uh, uh, that uh, uh, what's his name, who was a truck driver in Chainsaw Massacre? Ed, Ed uh, Gwynn, yeah. Ed Gwynn, he, he actually yeah. gave me Ed Gwynn's uh, contact. That's how I got in touch with Ed Gwynn. I didn't yeah. know about his band, though. Yeah, Ed Gwynn. Uh, so Texoid, it was a band. I'm not sure how many gigs they actually played, uh, but Canson, you know, had me write a screenplay for Texoid that was mm -hmm. like going to be a, a kind of a UFO versus a country, country and Western band kind of comedy. Uh, it was really funny. And uh, he got Carry On to do a comic book of the of Texoid. I might have. Oh. I might have some of the artwork here for that. Um, and it was like, and so Canson, uh, Canson also uh, became enhorred of this band uh, who he had, he also took under his wing a, a young guy named Barry Wilson, whose father was an oil man in Houston. And Barry Wilson was looking for something to do, someplace to put some money. So Jack Canson kind of grabbed him and uh, Barry kind of funded a movie for Jack about a Southern party band, traveling, touring party band called Larry Raspberry and the High Steppers huh. that played frat parties and nightclubs and big concerts all around the South. So they, uh, so Canson pr uh, put together a documentary crew. Uh, Daniel was a cameraman, Richard Kouros was a cameraman uh, to travel around with Larry Raspberry and the High Steppers and shoot a number of their concerts. So they, they shot a number of their concerts, uh, brought the footage back to Texas and Pacific, and I edited it into a concert movie uh, called Jive Asp, A-S-S-P, because uh, that was one of, because Larry Raspberry had sort of like this biblical preacher kind of uh, rap on stage uh, and could wind up the crowd really well, and they did a, a, a song called Jive Asp. So, uh, uh, so Canson did the movie. Uh, it never really got distribution for some reason. I think maybe there was a falling out between Barry Wilson's dad and Jack Canson. I, I don't know. Um, but so Texas and Pacific, Jack Canson and Richard Kouros uh, had all these grand ideas and, and we did the, the rock and roll film and then Canson wanted to do features. And uh, so for a while we tried to work together and then eventually it became obvious if I was writing a script for Canson that I was less useful to Richard Kouros and so then they split up. Uh, and, and so gradually the possibilities in Austin, you know, we, with, Can with uh, Kouros's company, Texas and Pacific, mm -hmm. we put together a proposal to do a horror film called Mementos and it was a really good proposal package that we put together. But by the time we finished the package, um, the tax benefits that were available to film investors that made Texas Chainsaw Massacre possible were not really available anymore. So little by little, the possibilities of, for me of making movies in Austin were kind of falling apart. So uh, about that time, uh, my friend Courtney Gooden had moved to Los Angeles. Larry Carroll had moved to Los Angeles. Uh, David Schmoller, uh, another film school buddy of ours, had moved to Los Angeles. Uh, uh, James Jim Bogart had moved to LA. And uh, everybody was sort of calling to me from LA saying, why don't you come out here? There's a lot of work to be had. Uh, and Courtney was, and Larry Carroll were working on a movie called Roar which was uh, this infamous, crazy fucking movie about a uh, guy studying lions and tigers in Africa. Uh, and it was a movie that featured a hundred lions and tigers, none of them trained, all of them roaming the set freely, yeah. intermingling with actors. Uh, so Larry Carroll was the editor of that film and Courtney was recording sound on it. And, and they said, why don't you come out to LA? You could get a job here easy. So about that time, I was like kind of 
done with whatever possibilities there were in Austin. And uh, so I packed my Texas Chainsaw Massacre van up to the gills like uh, Beverly Hillbillies and went came across the country uh, and slept on Courtney's couch for a few weeks while I found an apartment. And, uh, excuse me, and uh, then went out and uh, interviewed for a job on Roar. And so my first job on Roar was basically to uh, take, they were shooting six cameras simultaneously, lions and tigers all over the set, a couple of actors doing dialogue, six cameras, no slates. So my first job there was to try to find sync points in the six cameras that were shooting simultaneously and synchronize the sound to all six cameras. Uh, so I did that for a period of time on the film. And then eventually uh, they let me start editing some scenes. And um, then Noel Marshall, the director, star of the film, saw some of the scenes that I was editing, liked the work I was doing. So thank God I was able to hire some other guys to come in and start syncing dailies. And I started just editing. Uh, then Larry Carroll left his position at Roar to go produce Tourist Trap oh, with yeah. uh, David Schmoller for Charles Band. And uh, so then I kind of slid up to the, to the head editor position on Roar. Um, and we hired a couple of other editors. One of them was a guy named Lee Percy, who's gone on to have a really great career in editing. Uh, and so we edited uh, that film there on the set kind of, so they had basically a set out in Palm, near Palmdale that was built on this uh, flood plain uh, dry riverbed that they filled up a little portion of it to make a, a like a lake and built their set and they had like all the cages for the lions and tigers nearby. Mm -hmm. They had a big building built for uh, like a, the commissary and uh, the editing rooms. In the editing rooms we had like six chems uh, which were the 35 millimeter machines for editing. They had a little Gumsterville village built uh, with some little small like uh, motor homes. Um, and Noel Marshall and Tippy Hedren, his wife and also co-star in the film had a, a trailer that they lived in. Uh, and at, at one point uh, some rains came and threatened a dam that was upstream from the set. Hmm. So one day I was in there just minding my own business editing and, uh, and um, Jan de Bont, who was the director of photography for the film, came running in and said, come out quick, we have to build, we have to build a dam. So we went out in the rain and started filling sandbags and tried to build a dam to protect uh -huh. the set from uh, this, this dam upstream that was uh, threatening to burst. Uh, we did that until it got dark and then I went, fuck this, I'm going home. Drove home. When I came back to the set the next day, the dam had burst, the set was flooded, the wow. building that housed the editing rooms was destroyed, the chems were buried like up to here in mud, a million and a half feet of work picture were washed downstream and buried in mud. And so we spent the next four or five months just digging out the equipment, taking all of the editing machines into Hollywood and taking them apart down to their tiniest little components and cleaning them with Freon and then reassembling them <clears throat> with Courtney Gooden, who was the technical genius of everything, kind of overseeing that. Uh, <clears throat> the editing staff was taking the film that had been dug out of the mud and cleaning it with hoses and squeegees and then sending it to MGM to get it cleaned. Finally, we, after months of work, we kind of we're back in business and editing again. And uh, Noel was screening the film every week at MGM uh, for school kids and anybody he could invite because I don't know what he was thinking. He was trying to figure out what was working and what wasn't working. Uh, and eventually it occurred to me that Noel was never going to finish the movie. And about that time, Larry Carroll called me and asked if I wanted to come over and edit Tourist Trap. Yeah. Uh, 
for him and David. So I took that opportunity to say goodbye to Roar. Well, I, I didn't know Roar was your first job because it, it came out, you know, much later. And I heard there were so many accidents on set with the animals and all these horrible stories. Yeah, the Roar uh, was a movie that was, it, it, they had been shooting it for probably a year or so before I got involved on it. Uh, they continued to shoot after I left. Uh, they continued to edit. They uh, was like, Noel couldn't finish the film. And I don't know if it was just because he was so obsessed with it. Uh, and eventually, I think it got released in Japan because a lot of money came from Japan, a lot of money uh, for the production. Uh, and it never really got a release here in the States until like just a few years ago when Alamo Draft House releasing picked it up and kind of promoted it as the most what the fuck movie mm -hmm. ever made, uh, which it truly is. If you, if you see it, it's truly like, you cannot believe that anybody would put his cast and crew in such danger with a bunch of lions and tigers. And uh, Jan de Bont got, got his scalp ripped open mm -hmm. um, when he was kind of in a hole in the ground shooting up at the lions. Uh, uh, Noel Marshall got dragged off the set by a lion uh, and a big gouge in his leg and spent some time in the hospital. Uh, they in, asked me to come out on the set one time because they needed an extra sound man. And uh, so I left the cutting room, came out. Noel said, here's a cane, like a wooden cane, you know, just with yeah. a curved end. Said, if, if any lions come to hurt you, just pop them on the nose with this cane and that'll drive them away. So I was like, so there I'm sitting with the Nagra and my cane going "Oh fuck man, I hope nothing happens here. And there's a bunch of chain link fence in front of me, chain link fence going down to the water uh, and the crew on one side. And now they've let the lions go on the other side of the chain link fence and Noel yells action. And then the lions just go down to the water get in the water, swim around the chain link fence. And next thing you know, they're like romping around the crew side of the fence and all hell breaks loose. And Noel Marshall screaming because he was one of those guys that felt like if you scream louder than a lion, you can command the lions. He was running around like crazy. People were going nuts. He comes over and takes my fucking cane and goes charging off like whapping lions and tigers. And uh, that day I said to myself, I am never going on the set again. As yeah. If they ask me, no, no way. Uh, they, uh, my wife who, who I came out from Austin with me, uh, not Sally, but now mm -hmm. Becky was there, uh, working as a, as an assistant editor and they would let her take a little Jaguar little baby jaguar out for walks in the countryside, uh, like on a leash. And it's like, okay, that's, that's great when the baby jaguar is like a little kitten and stuff. But one day that jaguar got big enough that when Becky said, okay, come on, let's go back to the ranch. The jaguar just kind of snarled at her and wouldn't go. And, and, you know, that was the day she realized, okay, this is not a very smart situation. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's the way it was. It was like, the, it was a job that you could get if you just got out of prison, if you just came to LA, no matter what, you could get a job on Roar. Yeah, I guess it was with Alma Draft House that had, they had this tagline, uh, no animals were hurt on set, but lots of people were. Yeah, <laughs> that, uh, it's, it's really true. You know, it was truly a dangerous and insane movie. There was no organization. I mean, I guess there wasn't like a PETA type thing, but to protect the actors. No, I don't know where PETA was at the time or where the ASPCA was, you know, yeah. uh, or if they were, we were out of their jurisdiction or under their radar, or if, yeah, I do not know because uh, Noel would buy ostriches to kind of, you know, dress the, the set to look a little bit more African and, Next thing you knew, those ostriches were dead because of the lions. And uh, they were in garbage bags in the freezer where the food was stored that, the, that fed the crew, just in case 
they needed them for a set piece later on. You know, it was just, it was, nobody was a professional lion trainer there. Yeah. Noel uh, had the command over the lions and they would sort of listen to him and he sort of understood their behavior, but you know, he was pushing the limits too, doing scenes in his underwear where he just showed a lot of uh, skin to the lions, which is something that you're not supposed to do. Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was a, what the hell were they thinking kind of movie and stays that way to this day. Yeah. So it was after that then that you worked on um, Larry's film, Tourist Trap. Yeah. So uh, I left, uh, I left Roar, uh, went to work on Tourist Trap and there I met uh, Charles Band, who mm. went on to kind of uh, like uh, promote my career over yeah, the years. Empire, yeah, Empire. Uh, yeah, and uh, so yeah, uh, David Schmoller directed. David had been a another film school buddy of ours, and I had uh, shot a movie for him called "The Spider Will Kill You," um, and so that was a it was a good experience working with those guys. Yeah, it, it's a good film. It's a creepy film. Had you worked in that capacity with Larry before uh, on a film of that level? Uh, no, only Roar, you know, uh, with, with Larry. You know, I, I was in film school. I was, uh, you know, studying to be a director, but I also edited the work that I directed and uh, found that I really liked editing as well and felt like it was, you know, director of photography, director, writer, editor for me are the are the chief occupations and editing was kind of the next best thing to directing that I that I found. So so I liked having that ability to work as an editor, you know, just to somehow survive too. So yeah, uh, Larry had been the head editor on Roar and Larry was happy that I was able to kind of take charge of, of scenes and take some of the load off of him. And uh, since he was really just producer on on uh, Tourist Trap, they needed somebody and I'm glad they called me. So you were editing all these, or, and uh, you edited Ghoulies as well, but all these early films, how did that transition to you directing? Uh, so basically I worked for Charlie on Tourist Trap. Uh, he hired me to uh, fix a movie of his called The Daytime Ended that uh, the director and editor had kind of quit in some sort of a dispute uh, and left this very messed up movie. Uh, so I uh, kind of edit doctored that film. Uh, I went on, left Charlie and edited some other films for you know other people around LA. Um, edited a movie called Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker or Scared to Death. I'm not sure it has gone through several different titles um, uh, with a, another company. Uh, and so I had kind of had a pretty good run as an editor for a while. And then Charlie called me back to edit. Maybe it was Ghoulies was the first thing back again. I'm, I'm not yeah. quite sure. Uh, and um, so I edited Ghoulies, uh, directed by Luca Berkovic. And uh, that was like another good experience, you know. And, and then I edited Ghoulies and then uh, some other films. Oh, Charlie directed uh, a movie called Trancers. Uh, and so I was editing these movies and then Charlie uh, liked the, the work that I did and started asking me to edit all the movies that he was directing. So I was directing, I was editing uh, uh, Trancers and then probably uh, uh, a movie about giant robots, not robot jocks, which was Stuart Gordon a little bit later. Um, but at a certain point, then I was editing movies uh, like shorts that were compiled into a feature uh, called Rage War. Uh, that Charlie was kind of testing a bunch of new directors for uh, his big plan to, to, to start producing, you know, a dozen or 20 or 30 movies a year. Um, so I edited these little kind of short segments of a larger movie. And at a certain point, I was just like, you know what, fuck this, I could be directing better than these guys. Yeah. And so I told Charlie I, that, that my goal was to direct. And, and um, so this movie Rage War 
didn't quite wasn't quite long enough when it was finally put together. And so I proposed that I would direct another little episode that could kind of fit into the puzzle of the film. Yeah. And so he agreed. And so I got two to two shooting days to kind of shoot this little Mad Max kind of rip off uh, sequence. Um, and then I just said, I'll, I'll edit for you, but I do want to direct. So when you start, you know, signing directors again, please consider me. So uh, then he kind of formed Empire Pictures and basically uh, at Empire, the, the, the way that he would develop properties is he would have a poster artist come up with poster ideas. He would have a title and a basic concept and then the, he'd hire a guy to do a poster. And then he would show you the poster and say, well, what about this? Does this appeal to you? What about this? Um, so he called me to his office one day and showed me a poster of a monster kind of coming out of a TV set. And it was very generic kind of monster, very generic looking poster. And I, but I kind of said, you know what, what if, um, what if this was a comedy? Could, could we do it as a comedy? Uh, because I kind of knew by that time what you could do with a Charlie Van budget and what uh, John Beekler, who was his creature makeup effects artist, what he was capable of doing. Uh, and to me, the idea of a monster coming out of your TV set kind of opened up a lot of possibilities for satirical uh, ideas. So uh, Charlie was not known for comedies at the time. He was mainly like a kind of fantasy horror filmmaker. But he agreed and said, okay, sure, we'll do it as a comedy. So, uh, so that kind of set me off on the path of making Terrorvision, which was really my first feature. Yeah, was that who um, created The Hungry Beast, that uh, designer? You know? <clears throat> yeah, uh, so for Terrorvision, I wrote the script. Uh, there was this monster that was called for uh, The Hungry Beast. Uh, and the guy who was uh, who basically ran the shop for Charlie Band to create monsters and special effects makeups was a guy named John Beekler who has passed mm -hmm. away now, but was very kind of very creative and had a great team of sculptors and artisans working with him. Um, but the kind of joke that we had at the time was every creature that John Beekler creates sort of looks like John Beekler mm -hmm. in a way. Um, that's like all the ghoulies from ghoulies. And uh, um, so, uh, but I wanted something for television that was like not like anything you had seen before. And that was not, uh, not symmetrical. That was kind of like a big, uh, boogery kind of a creature. Um, and so I kind of came to John Beekler with a bunch of ideas of what I would like to see. Um, and we fought a lot about the, about the design of the creature because, you know, I wanted like one big eye, one little eye, a big doofusy grin, like a little, some dog qualities, like a wagging tail, like uh, a lot of stuff that John didn't quite uh, agree with in the beginning, but uh, he did his best and he got some great sculptors that worked on the film, yeah. worked on the creature too, and created this thing that is the hungry beast in, for Terrorvision. Yeah, it looks great. And, I, and, you know, it's a central piece of the film, but I guess another, uh, you know, guy behind it was uh, Giovanni Natalucci, the set designer. I heard you and him went to different uh, swinger pads for inspiration for the sets uh, in LA. Yeah, for Terrorvision, there was a, I wanted to uh, kind of create a nuclear American family that was kind of everything horrible about uh, American families of the, of the mid 1980s. Um, and, I, and I wanted to do that basically because I wanted to have a, a bunch of characters that you would not necessarily be so sad when they got yeah. eaten by the creature. Um, and so that you might also sympathize with the creature more than with, uh, with the victims. Um, so somehow the, the script was the script and it, and it is pretty much the script that you see in the finished film. But what happened between screenplay and actual shooting was a 
bunch of amazing kind of lucky breaks that that kind of uh, helped make the film what it is today, which for better or worse, I understand that it's not everybody's kind of cup of tea and some people hate it and some people love it. And that's always uh, been the case with that film. But uh, from the very beginning, uh, we were going to shoot it at uh, Charlie's studio, which he had bought uh, just outside of Rome, which was the old Dino De Laurentiis studios, mm -hmm. which was, you know, six sound stages, an incredible office building, back lots, uh, but all gone to seed uh, and, and kind of wreckage. Um, but uh, Charlie had uh, an Italian producer named Roberto Bessi, who brought in a team of, of uh, players that, that were friends of his, one of which was uh, Giovanni Natalucci, this amazing uh, Italian production designer. And uh, so Giovanni came to Los Angeles to kind of discuss what the film was going to look like. And uh, so at the time I wanted to show him, you know, swinger pads in, from the San Fernando Valley, uh, uh, you know, like this guy that, that used to hang out uh, downtown that wore military uniform and passed out flyers in sort of grand Los Angeles kooky tradition. Um, and so we didn't actually go to visit a bunch of swinger pads, but we did uh, go to location services and get booklets, booklets after booklet of houses and talked about it endlessly and talked about the pamphlets that grandpa passed out, the, the lizard tail jerky pamphlets. Um, and uh, so Giovanni went back to Rome, started designing. And when I, then, then we cast, casting for Terravision, same thing happened. Uh, we were so lucky to get Garrett Graham. Uh, Diane Franklin came in and, and was so bubbly and great for the part of Susie. John Grise came and, and read for OD and, you know, brought something to the character that was hilarious. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted, uh, I wanted um, Mary Warrenoff to play the Elvira kind of character, yeah. uh, Medusa. Uh, but when Mary came in for the casting, she said, you know, this is the part that everybody would think of me for. But what I'd really like to do is play the part of, of, uh, Raquel Putterman, the, the mother of the family. And uh, I thought about it for a minute and, you know, I was like, well, yeah, that sounds phenomenal to me, you know, uh, because Mary Warnoff is like the least motherly kind of person that you could ever imagine having kids. Uh, so uh, the, and she was ecstatic that that Garrett Graham was going to play her husband. Uh, so so the casting came together in this phenomenal way. The when I got to Rome and saw the sets that Giovanni was building, the the house set with the the erotic art on the walls, yeah. the kind of living room with the kind of sunken conversation pit, the bar. Uh, and most of all, the, the pleasure palace, the, the jacuzzi room <laughs> with the swimming pool size jacuzzi. Uh, it was like more crazily grandiose than even I had imagined. So, so in a way, the, the film went from screenplay to all of these elements that kind of came together with the monster that uh, Beekler and his team created to, uh, to be more than the sum of its parts and and take on a life of its own. Yeah, it's uh, I love the actors' performances and it seems like they understood the material, but you've um, experienced uh, expressed some displeasure on the I guess critical reception or when it was released. <laughs> what do you think uh, that people don't understand it or why? Uh, you know, Terravision. Uh, I don't know if I miscalculated or, uh, I mean, it was, the film turned out to be pretty much the film that I imagined in my head as I was making it. Um, and I, I think I imagined it as a movie that A, would be for kind of stoner, you know, yeah. people that were kind of in the same realm as I was. But also I wanted to create a movie that 
that affected kids uh, in a way that uh, like Invaders from Mars, the original Invaders from Mars uh, affected me, which is you see a movie on television that looks like no other movie that you've ever seen before. And for me, Invaders from Mars and uh, 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T, both kind of very expressionistic uh, production design. Um, when I saw them as a kid, they haunted me because they were so, they, they captured not reality. It was like the expressionistic version of reality that is the closest thing to like a dream reality. Uh, so they were movies that even if I, I didn't see the entire film on at the time, you know, in one viewing, they stayed in my imagination. And I wanted Terrorvision to have that kind of quality. So uh, in a way, when Terrorvision was released, it was so unlike anything that anybody expected from a movie that would be in theaters. Uh, the performances were not they were not over the top but they were like right at yeah. the top you know uh and they were probably over the top but with a with an intentional kind of uh over the topness um the ending was not the standard kind of humans triumph over the mm -hmm. alien menace ending that you would expect in a movie like that the kiddie qualities of the film because uh, there, was, uh, there was a kid who was like the main character. The kid qualities of the film were kind of undercut by the weird erotic qualities yeah. of the film. Um, so it, in a way it was not anything that, that you would expect a movie to be. Um, so when it was released in theaters, it came on the heels of Charlie releasing, uh, I, I believe Ghoulies no, no, Troll and Eliminators, oh, yeah. uh, theatrically. Um, three movies, two weeks apart, not enough money to promote them or to create trailers or get trailers in the theaters in time. The week that Terrorvision was released, the uh, Space Shuttle Challenger exploded, mm -hmm. putting the nation in a very kind of sad mood. Uh, Terrorvision came into the theaters and not that many people saw it. Um, it immediately there were some people that kind of got the got the humor of it and loved it uh the critics are <laughs> did not get it at all and so uh it got kind of universally reviled by critics only a few critics kind of had anything nice to say about it uh michael ventura in the la weekly uh got it and liked it um uh and so it kind of put me in a tailspin for, for a few months after that, just mm -hmm. that something that you feel kind of expressed what it was you were trying to do was so universally kind of hated by the critics. Um, so I just kind of built some furniture for my house and with the help of Jim Bogard, my old friend, uh, and uh, kind of licked my wounds for a little while. And Gradually, what happened with television was it became so hard to find, except you could get it on VHS. And then as the VHSs got stolen or started disintegrating, you could barely get it anymore and kids couldn't see it. And the people that liked it started turning their friends on to it. And it became kind of like a, a rite of passage, yeah. kind of turning your friends on to it and enjoying it. And uh over the years, it kind of built this following of people that that really loved it in the in the way that I intended, which is like, what the fuck am I looking at when I watch it? Uh, but it makes you laugh in spite of yourself. Um, so it, for me, as I started going to horror conventions and uh, seeing how many young fans there were for that movie, it was really kind of a satisfying conclusion to my emotional journey of sadness of uh, terror vision. Yeah, it's become a, a cult classic and it's one of my favorite horror comedies. Definitely the oh, cool. best horror comedy of the <laughs> 80s, in my opinion. <laughs> that's great, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, that's, uh, it's, uh, I've been, I've been really pleased to, to meet a lot of people and very hip people that, that uh, record company people and, uh, you know, young film people that, that are really, that were kind of influenced by that film when they were young.
Yeah, I, and I guess the other big series uh, a few years later, you know, you're known for subspecies, where you shot the first uh, vampire movie in Romania. It seems like. How, yeah. how was that whole experience? Uh, so basically, uh, after television, I kind of developed some scripts for Charlie, and uh, it, I was in development hell for a little while, trying to write scripts, and they weren't, didn't work out. And then uh, had another script that was going to go in Italy, and just as as we were about to shoot, we were were there like doing pre production. Uh, Empire collapsed. Uh, then a few years later, Charlie kind of rose from the ashes of Empire with uh with full moon mm. and uh he called me in to edit a couple of films for him and uh then one day he, he got me into his office and uh he showed me a poster of a vampire movie called subspecies and he had basically been approached by a expatriate romanian named jan ionescu who had been living in the states uh, but after the revolution, wanted to go back and uh, do business in Romania and start making movies there. So he can he put together a deal where the Romanian government would pay for the or the Romanian film studio at Bufta would pay for the Romanian cost if Charlie would pay for the cast and you know all the American costs of the film. That kind of a deal is like gold for a guy like Charlie Band, and um, so. Basically, I, I was never a big fan of vampire movies, but I am a fan of adventuring into some weird place to make a movie. Yeah. So uh, he basically sent me over to Romania for kind of a scouting trip of a week where um, I hooked up with Jan Ionescu and a guy named Vlad Paunescu, who was going to be the, the director of photography for the film, who... Uh, didn't speak any English, but the woman who was his girlfriend, uh, Juana Tofan at the time, uh, who later married him, uh, she was the costume designer. She spoke a little bit of English. So we spent a lot of time together, hanging out, eating, talking about the film, uh, and with, her, with Juana as kind of the, the translator between us. We also traveled up into Transylvania, and they showed me these spectacular locations that that yeah. we could access for like no money um and i saw the studio where the the some of the interior castle sets were already erected um and saw the equipment uh the old romanian film studio equipment which was pretty old and crappy mm -hmm. and i realized that if we were going to make the movie there the locations were going to be spectacular mm -hmm. the equipment was going to be limiting and and the movie was going to have a very kind of european vibe to it which seemed okay to me given that it was a vampire movie set in transylvania so i went back to charlie back, went back to the states uh really loved vlad and juana and said yeah let's we can do this movie so uh we hired a friend of mine jackson Barr, jack canson who was back from the days of uh, shootout in Texas and Pacific, uh, who was living out in Los Angeles at the time and, and was a screenwriter, uh, got him to do a rewrite on the film. And he brought some elements to the story, like the, like the bloodstone, the, the mm -hmm. ancient yeah. religious relic that drips the blood of saints that a vampire can be sustained by. Um, so with that script, a few months later, uh, we started casting, and uh, then I flew off to Romania. And, and at the time, uh, we had not settled on an actor to play Radu, the main badass vampire of yeah. the story. Um, but we had found a guy named Michael Watson, who uh, was a great Stefan, very kind of timeless kind of uh, character. Um, and he was working on... Uh, uh, General Hospital with an actor named Anas Hove, this Danish actor who was playing kind of the main bad guy on General Hospital at the time. And he suggested Anas to Charlie Band. Charlie auditioned him while I was already in Romania doing prep. And uh, 
hired him on the spot, you know, because Honest is is a phenomenal actor. Um, so basically, uh, there I was in Romania, and finally the the cast kind of flew over first. Uh, 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 first the two girls, and then uh, slightly later, Annas and Michael, and uh, we were going. I heard it was, it was a difficult shoot, obviously, you're in Romania, but with the, uh, you know, crew that didn't speak English, and how, how was it dealing with all of that? And did it, was it the government or the other, the locals, were they, you know, an issue? Did they take kindly to you shooting a, a film there? Um, so with, uh, with subspecies, shooting in Romania like six or eight months after the revolution. Uh, it was a really sad and depressed place. It, everything was kind of, there was nothing to buy in the stores except big bottles of peas. And uh, you sometimes couldn't get mineral water to drink. Uh, the crew, we would have like production meetings and the production meetings would begin with big tumblers full of vodka. So that by the end of a production meeting, it was just drunken madness. Uh, the AD, who uh, uh, one of the actor, one of the Romanian actresses described as having the face of a pervert, uh, basically looked at me one day as we were prepping and said, "You know what? Don't be, uh, don't worry, don't worry. Be happy uh, if you can accomplish one thing in a day in Romania. It's a good day." So. Basically, it was the pace of everything was super slow. The difficulties of going to visit a location, you had to wait for the man who had the key to let you into the location. Um, the crews were not getting paid very well. The money was not always arriving in time to pay the crew. So they were revolting. Every, every few days, we would have another kind of strike on set. Uh, some days the film wouldn't arrive, so we would have to shoot very little film in a day to try to make sure we had enough film to shoot the next day. The wine was plentiful and cheap, and uh, Michael Watson and Anna Sove had a taste for wine, so uh, there was a lot of drunkenness on the set, um, some some fights, some threats to my life from uh, some actors, uh, drunken dinners at the hotel, uh, which was just this dark and dingy and kind of sinister place uh, where glasses were swept off the table. Uh, and uh, people were blaming me for the, for the delays when it was really out of my control. You know, I could only do what I could do. Uh, so, uh, basically, I was just holding on to this train, trying to finish the movie and keep everybody as happy as I could keep them. Uh, so the, the film itself was a, a really difficult, difficult uh, production. I started keeping a journal uh, early on, uh, just day by day, just to kind of, for my own sanity, turn the crazy shit that would happen every day into comedy for myself, you know? Uh, and that journal is like a great read now because it really takes you into the, the, lo the place and the time. Um, so the movie was, a, was really, really difficult uh, to the point where we, we were shooting the, the sword fight scene at the end of the movie. And every time they'd start clashing these swords together and the swords had been clashed so many times that they were kind of like uh, serrated practically. So if you touched them, you would get cut and they would clash the swords and the sword would break off of the hilt. And then we'd have to go off oh, shit and find the welding shop at the, at Bufta, which was locked up because it was, they had gone home for the day. There was no man with a key. So we'd have to cancel the shoot for that day. The next day we'd start shooting and Anas and Michael would be drunk and uh, the stunt man would, would assure me, no, 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 it's okay to be a little drunk when you shoot a sword fight. But I would have to say, no, sorry, uh, we're not shooting today, you know? So it was like one thing after another, after another, till finally by the end, we were weeks and weeks over schedule and we were supposed to be gone, but it was like, almost Christmas time 
And now there were marches in the street and demonstrations that were kind of commemorating the revolution that had occurred like one year before. Uh, so we got out of there just like a few days before Christmas, uh, thank God. And I had the film and I didn't know what, what it was gonna be, you know, because, you know, you just shoot what you can and in the time you can shoot it. Uh, got it back and started editing. And luckily it turned into a film that Paramount, when they saw it, they were doing the, the home video releases of those films. They liked it enough to, to ask for a sequel to it. Yeah, it's a large, grandiose picture that you, I guess, hadn't done before on that level. But did Romania just allow you access to these basically ancient ruins? And I, and I heard the uh, citizens there didn't really care for the vampire lore or, you know, uh, Bram Stoker's uh, Dracula. You know, uh, for, for subspecies, we were able to shoot in churches, the most beautiful. Mm. Orthodox churches are supremely beautiful with the, the iconography and the gold and, and everything. Uh, churches, uh, old monasteries that were like national monuments. Uh, Rizhnov, which is a, a fortified little village at the top of a mountain uh, that now is a UNESCO site, uh, but then was just a ruin that was, nobody paid any attention to. Uh, we were able to shoot in little villages all over the place. Anything was open to us because a little money under the table at the, in those days when, when money was so scarce and, and everybody was looking to somehow find a way to make some money, uh, we were able to have access to all of these places. And, and then at Bufta Studios, there was like a standing kind of castle grand room and a couple of smaller rooms that served the story really well. Uh, you could go to a cemetery, find a cemetery keeper somewhere, get the key, open up a tomb and go down into the tomb and shoot in, inside tombs. So, so basically nothing was off the table for us. Um, the, the citizens that kind of understood what we were shooting, a vampire movie, kind of poo-pooed the idea of vampires yeah. as like a Western invention, you know? Uh, but they believed in werewolves. So mm -hmm. it's not like they were too smart for vampires. It was just, they had a whole other belief system. But as we learned when we started um, meeting with a folklorist to kind of come up with the, with the village ceremony uh, to cast out the undead, um, that there, there was a belief in the undead, that, that uh, somebody could be buried, but they aren't dead. And uh, if there's sickness in the village or your animals are dying, it could be caused by an undead person. So, uh, so th they had the belief, they just didn't have the whole blood sucking Count Dracula yeah. part of it down, you know? They weren't proud of that or like the historical aspect of Vlad the Impaler? They weren't happy uh, shooting their a vampire movie? Uh, you know what? Vlad the Impaler was a great hero uh, mm -hmm. in Romania. Even with all his impaling and like bloody deeds, he was, all of the bloody deeds were directed toward the invading people. Uh, and uh, he was known for kind of keeping the law with an iron fist. So uh, that iron fist and the, the kind of uh, 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 cruel control was a part of the of Romanian history and part of the, the whole Ceausescu kind of uh, dictatorship. Mm -hmm. And even in the way that businesses were operated in the time that we were shooting subspecies, there, there was a lot of uh, iron fisted control because that was the only way you could keep people in line, you know, uh, the, the, the set that we would shoot on, the, the, the communism had kind of uh, screwed with people's psychology so terribly, nobody could get fired. So nobody gave a shit about their job. They came to do their job, but you couldn't fire them. And so they didn't have to work fast. There was, they couldn't go anywhere. Uh, I was lucky that I had Vlad uh, who was the director of photography, who, who was an artist and committed, his wife, Juana, an artist and committed, the production designer. But the crew was like, they were there to do a job 
it didn't matter how long it took because they weren't going anywhere. Uh, as an example, the castle sets, you know, if you touched them too hard, they would kind of, the fiberglass would kind of crumble. And so uh, you would have to paint over the, the, the damage. Uh, if there was on one side of the set uh, of some damage that had to be fixed, there was an art department guy way on the other side of the sound stage with a paint bucket. He would dip his paint in the paint bucket, run across the stage, fix the damage. Uh, and if he needed more paint, run back across, walk back across the stage to the paint bucket. And once again, to fix it, it was like this crazy world. Uh, and basically you'd start shooting or you'd call cut and the sound level in the set would just rise as people just chatter, 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 chatter. Uh, so you'd have to call for quiet constantly. Uh, it was it was madness shooting that film, madness. Well, it it's, uh, was a you know great film once it came out. It's a beautiful film. It's a great like vampire epic, and I, and I guess it was a success enough for them to you know order a, a sequel. And it, and it, I heard you shot both the second and third film uh, together, back to back. Yeah, uh, at, when we screened subspecies, basically in those days, we would screen the films at Paramount in their theater for the executives of Paramount. And uh, thank God, somehow through the miracles of editing, uh, the miracles of music uh, with, with mm -hmm. the Amon Folk Ensemble who did the the score for subspecies and created that kind of real atmospheric Romanian mm -hmm. music. Um, the film turned out uh, pretty well, pretty well. Uh, and Paramount requested a sequel and not content to do one sequel because Charlie had this vision of doing 200 films by the year 2000. Uh, we, we set out to do two sequels, uh, back to back shooting them simultaneously. So I wrote a script that would be, that was like, the double movie, all kind of one continuous script of like 180 pages or something. Um, and I got Honest Hove back and I said, Honest, let's, I, I want to do this movie with you. He's a really great guy, but he was mm -hmm. drinking too much in those days. Um, and I said, Honest, I want to do this movie, but I don't want any drinking on the set. Uh, if you promise me you won't drink on the set, every night when they're taking off the makeup, I'll come and drink with you in the makeup room. Uh, and he agreed to that because he knew he, he had like overstepped it on the first one. Uh, Michael Watson, I couldn't bring back because I just, he was too much trouble to work with. Uh, Laura, Laura Tate, who played uh, Michelle in the first subspecies had had some problems and had a couple of young kids and couldn't see going back again for you know what was gonna be three months of work. Um, so we got, luckily got Denise Duff, who, who uh, kind of took over that role um, and went back and still were able to access, you know, even more locations, some of the same locations, but then Castle Corvin further north um, and uh, got Jan uh, Hajduk, who, who plays the uh, police Lieutenant Maureen in the film. Uh, who's like you know, a phenomenal actor. That was the great thing about Romania was uh, as difficult as it could be to kind of manage the crew. They, there were people on the crew who really could do their job, like the, the grips and stuff. And once you got them on your side and they wanted to, to do their work, they, they would do anything for you. Uh, and the other great thing was the, the actors of Romania were really well-trained. The theater tradition in Romania was like long-standing and there are many, many little theaters in Bucharest, for instance. Uh, so we were able to bring in some really great actors for the films. Uh, with Honest Not Drinking, uh, we set out to shoot two and three back to back and it was like a long, long stretch. Uh, but we got to travel all over the place and be in some really beautiful places, some really dodgy hotels, but, you know, being together and uh, having a glass of wine at night and then being able to shoot during the day. Uh, we had um, 
Wayne Toth and Norman Cabrera, who were the makeup effects artists for Subspecies 2 and 3, who kept Honest really happy uh, and played music for him. And uh, they had they were they had a band, and so I kind of cast them as the rock band in the film. Oh, uh, so it was like a real, it was a it was a much more pleasant experience. It's like when, once you leave someplace like Romania the first time, and all the difficulties, what the the bad memories kind of fall away, and you just remember the good times of friendship and glass of wine, and you know all the stuff that kind of like the social aspects of making a movie that kind of enhance the whole process. Um, so go, coming back and being able to work with Vlad and Juana again and renew our friendship, it, it was a much happier experience, subspecies two and three. Yeah, and as far as the cast, you brought back most of everyone. Was there any uh, attempt to try to bring back Angus Grimm who played the, the tall man in Phantasm? And he, he was in the first one. I, I forgot yeah. to ask, but how, how do you get involved with that? You know, Angus Scrim was one of those casting decisions that uh, Charlie kind of uh, came across after I was already in Romania doing uh, pre-production. Um, <clears throat> and Angus came in, it was like one of those cameo appearances where he flies in, you shoot him out in two days and he's gone again. Uh, so he came to, to uh, Bucharest. His flight got diverted to some god forsaken town and they had to drive him to Bucharest. So he was already kind of wiped out from the travel when he got there. Uh, I was expecting this sinister, very kind of strange, overwhelming character that I had seen in Phantasm. And what showed up on my set was a very sweet man. I was like, holy shit, what are we going to do to make him look like yeah. the king of vampires? Uh, so we piled some wigs on his head, maybe one too many, uh, and did the best we could it, because we had one day to, to costume him and prep him and another day to shoot and maybe two days to shoot. And then he was out of there. So, uh, so, and, and honest kills him in the, in the first one. So yeah. there was really no reason to bring him back again. Um, but we did for subspecies two and three, I, I thought it would be interesting now we'd seen, we had met Radu's father. So I thought maybe it'd be cool to meet his mother. And what if she's a mummy and he calls her mummy? Uh, and so we got Pamela Gordon, who was this very, uh, had an eating disorder, very thin, thin woman, but a really fine actress uh, who, uh, to play the part. And uh, she submitted herself to this full body yeah. makeup every day that had to be horrible. And she could barely see out of a little hole in her eye and had to be kind of led everywhere and carried up the steps to the cave that was up at uh, up a hill. Um, so, so we basically had met Radu's father. Now we get to meet his mother and and I and I think I like that dynamic that 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 they managed to to pull off. Yeah, who did her her makeup? This whole uh, getup. That was a uh, uh, Wayne uh, Wayne Toth and Norman Cabrera, who are both mm. incredible makeup effects artists who are who work to this day. Uh, they came up with the makeup. They applied it every day, not only to her but also to Honest. So they mm. were really really busy. And you brought back the cinematographer for the uh, first, it seems, for two and three, and they're they're beautiful, the photography in it. But the um, fourth one, you know, has has a different look than the first first three, definitely. Yeah, the first three, uh, because uh, Vlad, you know, was a Romanian artist cinematographer. Um, the first film, we shot the first uh, few days. Uh, sent the dailies off to uh, to Italy. Charlie looked at the dailies and did not like the look of the film, so he was ready to fire Vlad and uh, and bring in Adolfo Bartoli, who was an Italian cinematographer who I've worked with also, who had Charlie, who was Charlie's kind of favorite cinematographer at the time. Uh, so by that point, when Charlie wanted to fire Vlad, I. 
understood that that Vlad was the only way we were going to get to make this movie because Vlad had command of the crew. Vlad, the producer, Jan Ionescu, was locking himself in the hotel room every day by that point. So it was really Vlad and me and uh, kind of coming up with the day's work and Vlad kind of keeping the crew in line. Um, so I told Charlie, no, we can't fire Vlad. And I had to go to a big meeting at Bufta Studios with the heads of the Romanian film industry and defend Vlad because they said that you, that you can't fire Vlad because uh, he works for us. And so, so basically I told them why I wanted Vlad and how much I enjoyed working with Vlad and somehow managed to save his job uh, for the film. And uh, with the one kind of uh, loophole that, that uh, Charlie would fly uh, uh, Adolfo Bartoli into Bucharest and Adolfo would kind of advise Vlad a little bit on lighting for a, an American style film, which was basically backlight. You know, you gotta have some backlight in there. And Vlad was uh, doing it very naturalistically. Uh, we, the first few days dailies were were uh, developed at a at a lab, like in I I, I think in um, you know next to to Romania somewhere, uh, and and so they didn't look that great anyway. Um, but uh, and Adolfo came to Bucharest and stayed for a couple of days and took me aside and said, please, Ted, I don't want to work here, so so you keep working with Vlad. And I was like, yes, Adolfo, I'm totally totally up for that. I I want that to happen. So. Uh, and we were shooting on Fuji film stock, which has a very kind of creamy, warm quality to it. So, so once Vlad understood this concept of backlight, uh, the the film started looking more and more like it, like it should look. And two and three looked great. Subspecies four, when we came to make that, a few years had passed. Vlad was busy now running the studio, uh, Castel Film Studio. Um, and so we brought Adolfo in to shoot uh, subspecies four. And I think it was shot on Kodak stock, so it has a much harder kind of quality to it. The light is more harsh. We didn't have as many days to shoot. The locations, the budget was much lower, and we couldn't travel to locations, distant locations, so we had to find places around the city of Bucharest. Uh, so the film itself has a much different, more kind of lurid uh, Italian look to it. Um, so that that's the story of that. Yeah, it's still a good film, but it's more further removed. Now, I do want to get to your, before it's too late, to your documentaries. Um, I, I was curious first how you got in, uh, involved with this other documentary for Chainsaw called The Shocking Truth. That, that's the first time I've, I had actually seen you. Um, how did you get to being in that film? Uh, you know, over the years, uh, I guess people had tried to do some kind of documentary about Chainsaw Massacre. And uh, the guys who produced that film contacted me and asked if they could come interview me. And I was like, okay, sure. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you what I can remember. Uh, and so that's how I got involved in that film. Um, I didn't, all I did was, you know, do an interview with them. Yeah. Were, were you willing to speak about it? Had you spoken about Chainsaw much uh, prior? No, that was kind of the first, the first kind of interest that people had shown in kind of documenting what happened with Chainsaw Massacre. Hmm. And and you got into documentaries yourself a little later on. I know you did a, a, a Dali and, and Disney one, which I just w uh, watched. It's really good about D Destino. Oh, cool! How'd yeah, I like making that. Uh, so what happened was uh, after. Charlie Band's company kind of like, you know, we did Subspecies 4, uh, had written a Subspecies 5, which was going to be like the prequel to the story. <coughs> um, Charlie's ambitions kind of got too big and Paramount uh, pulled the plug on, on the company. Uh, and by that time, we were making, you know, children's fantasy films and, and had kind of branched out a little bit. But work dried up for me at the end of that period. And um, so I was looking for something else to do. And I had uh, some friends, a guy named Gary Allen and his wife, Barbara Tonys, who uh, 
actually had worked for Charlie in the days of Terravision doing the, the posters and the marketing for, for the releases of Terravision Eliminators, that, that whole slate of movies. Um, they had a marketing company that was uh, doing kind of like uh, behind the scenes little documentaries and featurettes for Disney primarily. So I kind of, I asked them if I could come and just kind of teach myself how to, how to edit on an Avid because all my editing before then had been 35 millimeter. Um, and so I just started going out to their company and using their Avid when they weren't using it and just teaching myself how to, how to edit electronically, uh, which led to them kind of asking me to edit some of the little pieces that they were producing, which led to me starting to produce uh, some pieces like for the Alamo that was shot in, in, uh, outside of San Antonio for, uh, and, and that led to a, a run of probably 15, 17 years of, as they got more work from Disney, uh, doing a lot of behind the scenes, uh, documentaries, and then led to me doing a lot of, uh, kind of little documentaries about the artists uh, that worked for Disney and their families and Walt Disney and his dogs or his family and his daughter, Diane Disney, uh, like kind of creating these little pieces that were like uh, just uh, illustrations of what the studio was like back in the heyday of, of Disney. We did a piece that was like for Blu-ray when Blu-ray first came out and you could kind of trigger go off on different branches from your documentary. We did a piece about uh, for, for Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs about life at the Disney Studios back in the days of the Hyperion Studio, where we got old uh, audio interviews with a lot of the people that worked at, back in those days and created the feeling of what it was like to be at the studio. Uh, that string of work led to uh, a guy named David Jessen, who was like the executive at Disney, kind of in charge of the, the, the home video, like uh, additional content uh, uh, department, uh, had a documentary that, that they had produced, but never finished. Um, they had shot a bunch of interviews for uh, a movie called Destino. The, the idea behind Destino was, um, Back in the 40s, Disney had, uh, his artist had turned Disney on to Salvador Dali. And uh, Disney was always looking for new artists to come do some sort of uh, uh, like uh, uh, inspirational art for movies or uh, uh, concept drawings and stuff. And so he, he was always open to the idea of bringing European artists into the studio. Uh, Simultaneously, it turns out that, that uh, Dali was a big fan of Walt Disney. And uh, Dali considered Disney like a, one of the great American surrealists. Yeah. So uh, they, Disney had hired Dali to come to the studio to, to create a, like an animated, surrealist animated short film to be one of part of one of his package movies like uh, make mine music or the movies that were like combinations of little shorts to make a feature so uh what happened was that disney studio ended up with a lot of story sketches original dolly story sketches and some paintings for backgrounds uh that it turns out contractually they did not own unless the movie was produced. So Roy Disney Jr. in about the year 2000 or so, uh, once he discovered that, uh, said, well, let's just make the movie. So he hired a team of animators uh, to try to make sense of the story sketches and, and the storyboards that had been created and do plot out and create the movie that Dolly and Disney wanted to make. So once he made that film, Disney Studios wanted to release it, but it was only six minutes long. So they needed a documentary to accompany the feature to release it on DVD. Uh, so David Jessen had 
hired a company to shoot interviews and create the documentary. They had shot a bunch of interviews and didn't never figured out how to crack the story and, and put the interviews together in a way. So they had Jesson hired another company and the other company, same thing, didn't crack the story. So finally, he came to our company, EMC West, and asked if I wanted to take a crack at, at, at the story. Uh, for me, it was an opportunity of a lifetime because the truth is uh, back in film school at UT, I had discovered Dali in the library and loved his art. And I had a dog that came with me to campus every day, uh, unleashed, came to campus, waited for me. His name was Salvador Doggy. Oh. So for me to have the opportunity to work on a Dali documentary was like a great lifetime yeah. thing, you know? Uh, so I took it. And um, by that time I understood how to, uh, how to, script a documentary from interviews and how to create kind of the emotional flow of the story. And so with the interviews that were already shot, with the art that I was able to access from the Dali Foundation, with, uh, uh, I went to Spain to a, to a little horror film festival that uh, was a screening a film of mine. And on that trip, I was able to go to Figueras and and uh, shoot one additional interview with uh, Monsi Algura, who's like the, the head of the museum's collection there, to kind of fill in the missing blanks from all the other interviews that were already shot. And um, was able to complete the documentary, uh, which uh, I think is a really great story. It's a, one of the yeah. kind of like lesser known stories of Disney history and, and like uh, uh, the, the, the friendship between two super different artists, but two artists who were really kind of the quintessential artists of the early 20th century. Yeah, and you went to do uh, the exhibit. You were the curator for the, afterwards, Disney did that exhibit at Disney and Dali. How, how'd you get involved in that? And how'd you like doing it? Uh, you know, the what happened was uh, the, the documentary was, was what it was. Uh, I had also gone uh, a few times up to the Walt Disney Family Museum in San Francisco to shoot little pieces with Diane Disney Miller, who was Walt's daughter, uh, and some old Disney artists, you know, talking about the Jungle Book or some, you know, uh, bits and pieces of Disney history that we were able to kind of shoot there to get Diane's kind of input on. Uh, Diane liked me a lot, and I liked her a lot. And at one point, I suggested, you know, there's this the story of Dolly and Disney, uh, uh, you guys really should do an exhibition about it and kind of planted the seed in her head. Well, a few years later, um, David Jessen, who had hired me to do the documentary, uh, had uh, Diane passed away too early um, and her family wanted to honor her wish to, to actually get this exhibition up. And so because I sort of, had a command of all of the of the story and and knew where all of the bits and pieces of interviews and artwork and everything was he suggested me as the curator of this exhibition uh i had never curated an exhibition did not know what it involved exactly but i imagined it would be sort of like a movie that you would walk through and the movie would play out on the wall and uh, with audio uh, and music and, and that would kind of take you into the uh, atmosphere of the time period. Um, so I proposed that to the family and um, they said yes. And so that began like a probably two years of very slow work, slow work, uh, museums work at a much slower pace than, uh, than movies do, um, but getting all the approval approvals, gathering the art, picking the art that would be most illustrative, picking the kind of hands-on kind of bits of the exhibition, uh, working with not only the Walt Disney Family Museum, but also the, uh, the Dali Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida, which has the largest collection of Dali art outside of Europe. Uh, 
in the United States and is an, an amazing museum with some great works of Dali's. Uh, they decided to partner up with the Disney Family Museum so that they would, so the exhibition would travel from San Francisco and open in Florida for a while too. Because it's, you know, it's like the, the name alone, Disney and Dali yeah. together, you know, it's like brings in a lot of people, you know, from a, a lot of different interests. Um, so it, it proved to be kind of like making a movie in that you're just gathering bits and pieces. And then I, I took, you know, went through all the Disney animated films to pick the most kind of surreal bits and pieces yeah. to edit together montages of that, put together uh, all the video that I could find of Dali speaking and of Walt Disney speaking, audio, and put together the, the, the kind of audio collage that would be string you through the whole exhibition. Uh, got uh, got uh, Sigourney Weaver to, to do the narration for us. Uh, so it was a really, really interesting experience, you know, a whole different world to explore. It sounded so cool. I would have loved to have seen it. I love, you know, surrealism and, and classic Disney animation like Fantasia, but I guess there's no way, you know, it's, it's not around anymore. You're not going to do no, it again. No, you could probably go on the Walt Disney Family Museum website and they, they might have like some images from it. And also the Disney, uh, the, the Dali Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida might have images of it. Yeah, it's very sad. That's the only, you know, you make a movie and it's yeah. it's around forever, you know, but uh, you do an art exhibition, it disappears. You know, the other people wanted wanted to take it and travel it elsewhere, but the the problem is the art has to rest between yeah. periods of exhibition. You have to get so many permissions. Uh, the Dali uh, Foundation in Figuera, Spain, is not so willing to let their art go out on uh, traveling. So it was it just proved to be too impossible. Yeah, well, the documentary itself is really good. Were you interested in the documentary as a genre? Because you went on to make a few others, it seemed, like Finding Happiness, which I haven't got around to seeing, but I'm very- oh, It'll make you, uh, yeah, it'll make you uh, calm if you watch it. You know, uh, I was not a, I was not, I didn't think of myself as a documentary filmmaker until I started doing these little Disney uh, documentaries about the history of Disney and found that, uh, that it, it, it's like you're scripting from what other people have to say uh, and you're uh, it's up to you to find material to kind of cover what they're saying visually uh, so it's a it's a whole different kind of way to work but it's it's fascinating and the end result has the same kind of emotional power as uh, making fictional features and sometimes even more emotional power. So uh, I got to be very fond of, of making documentaries. So when, um, you know, the, the Disney Dali was like, kind of like what came from my heart because it really was something yeah. that I was fascinated about. And then a few years later, uh, my old friend, Roberto Bessi, who was the mm -hmm. executive in charge of Terrorvision, uh, had befriended some people who had who came, found him because he's a film producer, some people from a, an organization called Ananda, oh, yeah. which was a yoga meditation community based on the principles of, of, uh, of uh, Paramahansa Yogananda, um, but, but had split off from the SRF, uh, the Self-Realization Fellowship. They came to Roberto wanting to make a documentary about their lifestyle. And Roberto knew that I was making documentaries at the time and also saw my personality as being something that might kind of fit in with the, with the people of Ananda. Uh, so he introduced us um, and I kind of pitched how I imagined their documentary could be as like a self-portrait of their community because their whole idea is uh, to have uh, like, intentional communities of spiritual people who, who kind of share the same values of meditation and, and uh, yoga uh, and can live kind of off the grid of normal society, but contribute to society and have doctors and caretakers and, and uh, 
you know, be, but be kind of outside of the influences of drugs and alcohol and sex and blah, 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 blah. Uh, so uh, I met with them, pitched them this idea of a self-portrait of their community. And then I had to kind of go through this process where I met some of the, some of the Swamis that were, that taught underneath uh, Swami Kriyananda, who was their main guy, uh, and convinced them that I had good intentions. Then went to meet Swami Kriyananda and uh, he was a big fan of Bambi. And uh, I said, oh, I've done a lot of documentaries for Disney and I did this incredible documentary about Bambi. Um, and so he liked me immediately. And some of the people from his organization that didn't like me uh, kind of went to him and said, oh, but Swami, he's made horror movies. He's made vampire movies. And Swami Kriyananda, was like very old at this point. And he said, oh no, I liked, uh, I liked um, Vincent Price. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, he was like, so we got along, but, but it took about a year of me meeting with him once a week and sitting and talking about, you know, a variety of subjects. Um, and, you know, I, I was honest with him and I'm honest about my spirituality is not like Christian necessarily, yeah. not, uh, Hinduistic like theirs is, mine is more kind of LSD, everything is connected kind of a, a spirituality. But the thing about the Ananda people is most of them that joined Swami back in the 60s and 70s were kind of like people like me who were, who just kind of went a different way and went into um, uh, yoga. Uh, so so uh, I liked them a lot and we got along very well. And so the, the process of making that film was a year of, of just getting to know everybody, interviewing people, and then a few weeks of shooting at their communities and creating and, and just finding a way to tell us, tell, let them tell their story. So you weren't really interested in Eastern spirituality or Hinduism much before or yoga, meditation? No, I mean, I'm mm. interested to the point of like, I'm curious, let me yeah. read about it and see, not to the point of, you know, spending an hour every day meditating or doing any of that. You know, I have my own meditation, which is writing or, or sitting and playing my guitar for an hour, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I tried it uh, when I went there and lived at their community for a little while. I, I tried meditating and, and I, and I, believe in the benefits of it but i'm not a i don't want a guru or you yeah. know i'm not i'm not a follower in that in that way and my sense of spirituality is satisfied by my own kind of musings right. about it you know but for me it was a, a fascinating couple of years spent kind of learning a, a different way of thinking you know yeah, it seems like a fascinating film. I see it's on Amazon, but just the whole community and the uh, Kriyananda, I guess he was a disciple of Pramahansa Yogananda, the autobiography of a yogi. Uh, uh, yeah, it's yeah. really interesting. I'd like to see it. It's interesting in that you, there's a lot of life principles that they that they adhere to that, are, that I think are really cool. Uh, they're, they're, they have their own school system. They're uh, you know, and they have doctors and really smart people, smart computer programmers. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a community of really intelligent people who have just chosen to kind of limit their, the distractions in their lives. And, and I like them a lot and, and living there and hanging out with them was a, was a really sweet period of my life, you know? Yeah. It kind of reminded me of the heart, heart of Krishna movement a little bit. But I, I, got, I got to see the film and find more out about it. Um, now, as far as, uh, I guess, to wrap up here, do you have anything coming up or any news on uh, Subspecies 5 or anything in the works? Yeah, right now uh, we're sort of in a holding position for, you know, to wait till vaccines and COVID is a little mm -hmm. safer. But uh, we have the script for Subspecies 5. Uh, Anas and Denise are really eager to get to work on it. Uh, we have a company in Serbia to, that, that is going to produce it with us because uh, now uh, Romania has gotten too expensive for the kind of money Charlie wants to pay for it. Uh, so uh, we're hoping by summertime we'll be able to do it. Uh, I'm going to do a little short film for Charlie Band, uh, uh, 
called Don't Let Her In. That's like a interesting little kind of demonic story that should uh, come out in the late spring. Uh, so yeah, I'm staying busy, uh, but staying home, you know. Yeah, I'm looking forward to you, um, especially Subspecies 5. And, and you're filming in a, in a different country now, but I'll be following the updates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look for it. Uh, it'll be it'll be around soon, as soon as it's safe to travel. All right. Thanks so much for talking to me, Ted. I know we went a little overboard here, but I really appreciate it. Okay, man. Okay, I hope it works out for you. Okay. All right. Talk to you, man. Okay.